All right, they have my thing up, and uh, the secret is there is a box behind this stage every year, and I will fall off of it, so. <laughs> um, I am Laura Newsom. I'm a software engineering technical lead on the customer experience team at Cisco. I'm a co-host on the Angular Plus show. I'm an Angular GDE, an NX champion. <laughs> and if you want to reach out to me, you can do that on LinkedIn, Blue Sky, or Twitter. Um, oh. I left the QR code there too. That is a QR code to the slide. There are some code examples. They are small and hard to read. Um, so the talk I have for you is called Reactive Patterns for Angular. Um, I'll give everybody's phones a second here. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Laura, why, are we, why do we need to talk about reactive patterns for Angular? Um, don't we have signals now? Isn't that just going to make our app reactive? Well, you know, we have signals, but like any new tool, it's not going to magically fix the problems that already exist in your code. So why are we talking about reactivity? Angular compiles to JavaScript, and JavaScript has asynchronous events. And our users keep doing stuff to our app, so we need to keep our, the state of our application up to date, accurately, quickly, and, and keep it current. The other reason we should care about reactivity is the Angular team is on fire. They are packing as much as they can into every release, and in fact, they are giving us a whole new reactivity story in Angular, right? We've already got our new signal-based reactive primitives. They're rethinking change detection, moving towards fine-grade reactivity, and there are things you can do today to get your code ready as these new features get released. So when we talk about reactivity, I'd like to think about it with three ingredients. We've got producers, consumers, and side effects. So producers are like elements or events that are capable of being observed. So in Angular, we've got some producer examples here. That includes things like button clicks, inputs, observables, and then signals, right? Those will be producing values for us. We've got our consumers. So these are going to be observing our producers and using the results. So for Angular, we've got components, view templates, even with NGRX component store, NGRX reducers, right? And then we have side effects. It's a little trickier, they're basically consumers, but they'll take an event, do something, and emit another event, right? And so similar programming concepts will include middleware, monads, higher order functions. Um, and then for Angular, we have a lot of things that can do side effects for us, uh, including ArcGIS operators, pipes, interceptors, and then signals computed and signals effects will be taking the produced value from signals, doing work to them, and producing new signals, right? So let's put these ingredients together. Producers are like, yo, something happened, right? And then the side effects and the consumers are like, I'm waiting for this one special thing to happen. Just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm waiting, right? So SpongeBob in his kitchen is waiting for order in, right? He gets order in, he makes some Krabby Patties. Order in doesn't go out, it's Krabby Patties that go out, right? So he's done some work. Now Squidward's just sitting around like he's ready to consume. So he's gonna digest the results, without any side effects. All right, so we get into trouble when we start to mix up responsibilities, though. So if we follow good reactive patterns, it's fairly easy to figure out what's going on in our application, but I think we've all run into a component that makes us feel like this, right? Somehow it works, but I don't want to touch it, I don't want to try to untangle it, and I'm not going to try to figure out what's going on. Um, so we've got some patterns that we can start to use to start to untangle that, right? So pattern number one, let's use setters on our inputs instead of using ng on changes. So ng on changes will run any time an input changes, right? So this is the code specifically to see if product ID changes do something with that, right? The problem with that is it's gonna, ng on changes literally runs any time an input changes, and that requires logic to figure out which input changed. Um, so we can make this a lot more precise. Using the set keyword, we can turn our inputs into setter functions. So when new values come in, we can use those to set values. Um, so using setters, the setter is only gonna run on the input that changed. There's not gonna be any filtering logic involved and you don't have to implement ng on changes anymore. Um, and this pattern can be easily adapted to signals. So that's a signal, boom. All right, easy replacement, right? Um, 
Pattern number two, let's cut out the middleman when we're dispatching uh, user events and actions. So let's have a little chat about output properties. So Angular outputs are a nice tool to be able to pass some data from a child back up to the parent. They are not a good tool for passing data up to other parts of the application, right? And you're tightly coupling your component tree all the way if you're chaining these events together, right? So let's look at the data flow for selecting a product. So if we declared an output, we're going to click selected product. It's going to emit a new event. And so we want to get the data from child one to child two. So child one events the event. It's got to go up to the parent one, up to the route, uh, app route, back down through inputs to parent two, back down to child two, right? That is five components involved in just getting the data from child one to child two. There is a lot of opportunity in there to mess something up, right? So what we need is a stateful service that can be accessed from anywhere in the application. So here we have a stateful service. It's connected to all the classes in our application if, if we choose to, right? So child one's gonna emit an event. It's gonna pass that data to the stateful service, which can then pass that to child two, right? So that's a much shorter feedback loop there. Um, and in fact, that stateful service could pass that data to all of the components at the exact same time. So we have some options for built-in stateful services in Angular. We can use service with a subject. We can use service with a signal, right? Or um, another option we have is router module, right? It's, uh, you're not gonna wanna put all of your state in the router module, but there are certain like user selections. Those can be stored off in a browser URL. So for shareable user selections, so if you want somebody to be able to copy a link and send it to their boss or send it to your mom or whatever, you could leverage the Angular router for that. Um, so let's look at what that might look like in our component. So here we have a user selecting a product. It's going to go to the router. Uh, the state store is going to be reading data from the router, and then the state store is going to pass that data to the components that need it. Now, I want you to notice that even within a single component, we're still going to drive that state the same way, right? We up, like the detail view says, hey, something happened. The router store is going to say, I know what to do with that. It's going to pass it on to the state store. The state store says, I know what to do with that too. And it's going to hand it down to the end consumer, right? All right, because we want to be careful to maintain that single flow of state. I see code like this all the time, where you're trying to drive state with the router, but you're also just going to go ahead and manually set it, right? Don't do that. You're going to add a complication that you're going to have to untangle later. Um, so let's combine our first pattern with our second pattern. So for here, our users are going to select a category from the header. We're going to go click. And then in the header component template, we're going to use the router outlet to directly change the route. So that's about as fresh as that event gets, right? Um, so we're going to pass a category ID here. So that's a path parameter. It's a dynamic value that we've declared in our route. Um, and then we're going to consume it here in the component property, or the component. Now you might be saying, Laura, how are you con there, there's no activated route here. How are you consuming that? Well, it turns out as of version 16, we can consume all route params and resolver data in the inputs. And look, you can pair it with a setter, right? So to take advantage of that new feature, you just need to set bind to component inputs to true in your router configuration. All right, so let's work through how this works in our components. So our input has a setter. We know how that works, right? It's going to invoke the set selected category uh, method on our product service. So it's going to pass that value to the product service. That's calling next on a behavior subject. So we've declared a private behavior subject. If you're ever using subjects, you do not want to publicly expose those to your users. Um, and so when we're choosing behavior subjects, we want it to always have a value. And then subjects are multicast, so anything subscribing to them will always get the same value that everybody else is getting at the same time. All right, and then we publicly expose the observable property through a public property. Okay, yeah, let's do that again, but let's do a signals this time, all right? Setter, we got that. All right, so we know we're just like gonna call set on the signal here, right? Because they have built-in getters and setters. And then this is what our product service looks like now. So you can see the like kind of the benefit to that. Like since signals have built-in getters and setters, we can publicly expose those, right? So we don't have to mess around with writing our own, essentially our own getters and setters. All right, so pattern number three. 
let's compose our data before it gets to our consumers. So the reason we want to do that is because I personally prefer for my components to do very little. Components are harder to test than pretty much anything else in your app. It's a lot easier to test in your services. Um, the other big reason is that if you compose your data in one place, everybody that uses that data gets the same thing, right? If you're doing it in random classes here and there, if you don't do it exactly the same way, you might not get the same data out. And consumers just want to consume, right? All right, so let's combine our patterns. We've got our input setters, we're emitting our events close to where they happen, and we're composing our data before it gets to the consumers. All right, so let's see the state flow for selecting category. Click. All right, so the header is where we're selecting our category. That's going to update the router URL. The route is going to activate the products view route, and the product view has the setter on the category input, the category ID input, which is then going to set the stateful object on the state store, which is then going to pass that value to the consumers that care about it, right? Um, and notice how they got the same value at the same time. So let's say we, I said compose data, let's see how we do that. So in an observable service, we're going to uh, declare a data stream, a stream inside of our service. So this is gonna be called filtered products. The dollar sign is just to indicate that it's an observable. Now the selected category, this is going to be our outer observable. This is the one we're listening to first because it's the one most likely to change. And then we've got an inner observable, which is our products. Our products. So I've set that in the, com the constructor, wherever. Like That is just a stateful object holding all of our products, right? And then we're using switch map to get access to the values from the inner and the outer observable at the same time. And then we're going to use map. We're going to combine those together. And essentially, I'm going to take the value. We're pipe Notice I'm piping that off of the, outer, the inner observable. So we're going to take the products. If, the, if there's no category selected or if it's all, we're going to return all the products. Otherwise, we're going to filter by category. Now, inside our template, our component, we're going to declare a local property and set it equal to that filter products observable. Um, and then in the template, uh, we'll just use an ng4 for now, right? And we're going to use the async pipe to get access to the product array that is on uh, the uh, featured products observable. And it's going to iterate through that, and it's going to render our products to the page. Async is handling subscribing and unsubscribing for us. All right, so let's see this in signals. So in this case, uh, we still are going to declare a public property on our class, but this time we're going to use the computed function. This takes a callback, and inside that callback, it's listening for, uh, it's basically using selected category and products. We know selected category is going to be the most likely to change, and so since signals are tracking the cons their consumers, if a new value comes in for selected category, it's going to rerun that callback function inside the computed and then we will get new products. It's very similar in the component. We're just setting local property. And then the difference we see here in the template is we no longer are reliant on the async pipe because we're using that value directly. All right, we're going to practice one more time, uh, this time with the selected product flow. So users can select the products from the side menu, or they can select the products from the home page. Um, and then the header and the detail view both need selected products. So we've got two components that need to update at the same time, or else our users are going to have confusing data. All right, so let's walk through this flow for selected product. So our, somebody can click from our products view, right? So that's going to add a query parameter to our route. The, this time we're going to have the state store listening to the route directly, and then it's going to do its calculation to compose the data, and then the header and the detail view are getting the same data at the same time. We could also do that from the feature products. It's going to be the same flow, right? Update the route with a query param, router updates to the state store, state store pushes out new products, header and detail update at the same time. Meanwhile, in the code, I do want to point out query parameters are globally available. So you have to be a little bit careful if you're going to use an input setter with a globally available query parameter, because what if another component someplace else is also trying to set the state with that? Right? So that's why I'm directly consuming uh, the query params inside my service. 
All right, so inside our template, we're going to push a query param up to the URL using the query params directive off, uh, that's part of the router link. Do that. Now, inside the service, like I said, we're going to be accessing the query params directly. I just went ahead and skipped the observable for now. You can kind of backwards engineer that. But for this case, we're going to use the activated route directly inside the service, and we're going to use the toSignal method off of the RxJS interop package. And so what that's doing is it's automatically subscribing to that observable for us, and then it's going to, anytime we get new values, it's going to be updating that signal, right? So we can, at this point, our act, we can treat that selected product ID as a signal, okay? So that means we can use computed. We've declared a public property called selected product. It's going to be listening for changes in the selected product ID, um, and it's gonna, every time we get a new value, it's gonna, return either the selected product, or if we don't find that value, it'll return undefined, but that's fine. Then in the consuming components, again, we're going to declare a local property equaling the selected product coming out of the stateful service. And then in our templates, again, we will use that value directly. And we will, uh, if it's there, we'll go ahead and render it on the page. And then our views, the header, and the detail are going to get the same data at the same time and we're going to find out that pooch pants are on sale. And then we're going to immediately copy and paste that URL, and we're going to send it to our boss. <laughs> all right, so using all three patterns together, we can define a holistic data flow that can be followed throughout the application. So to put it another way, we are orchestrating a clear flow of data through the application. We are creating and maintaining single sources of truth. So that's why I was saying to not use uh, be cautious if you're using inputs with query parameters, because you might end up duplicating that state inadvertently. And then uh, we are composing our data so that all, the, all of the consumers are going to get the same data at the same time. You're also going to find that even if you're not using signals, if you take some time to rethink the data flow through your application, your code is going to be easier to read, easier to maintain, and more uh, performant for your users. That's the slide deck. Um, I do have a GitHub repo with some of the code examples. So uh, the one rule, though, is that nobody is allowed to start the Just Like Us uh, pet boutique. That's mine. So all right, thank you so much. <laughs>